On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Rackspace goes private, Dropbox didn't get breached, and a Wingu. That's right, the workspace aggregator that's the only one you'll ever need. Twiat on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 204, recorded August 26, 2016, A Wingu. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV is an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. For a free seven-day trial and 30% off the life of your account, go to itpro.tv slash enterprise and use the code ENTERPRISE30. Welcome to Twyat. This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I can't guide you by myself for that. I need a little help from my friends, starting with Mr. Brian Chi. He is the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, you have been running yourself ragged the last couple of days. How's the geek in paradise? Uh, the Geek in Paradise is tired. It's the first week of classes and the first session of Oceanography 418. We're teaching students how to build their own science instruments. And unfortunately, I, fortunately, I'm actually also now handling a uh, power monitoring system installation for the entire University of Hawaii system. So more than just a little tired. Uh, yes, the first week of classes back at a major university campus with so much bandwidth. Tell me, are there any enterprising students who are yet doing pen testing of the network? Not at the moment, but I'll tell you, um, I'm going to want to, you know, mimic Mudge very soon to test how secure these energy uh, monitoring networks are. Indeed. Remember, IT folks, if you ever want to stress test or break your gear... Give it to a university. Now, a man who doesn't break our gear, who actually fixes a lot of things, is Mr. Lou Maresca. He is a senior development lead at Microsoft and their fabulous CRM department. Lou, how are things over in Redmond? Fantastic. We're in release mode over here. Just like Brian, we're working nights and weekends to try to get things out. So uh, hopefully soon. I, and I got my Pied Piper on today. So uh, we're ready to go. Well, gentlemen, the die is cast. We've actually got a great guest coming up for you. If you, if you need to know a little bit about uh, the inner workings of IT, you're going to want to stay tabbed. But first, as always, let's kick it off with the blips. Now, Texas-based hosting provider Rackspace has gone private. In a deal worth $4.3 billion, Apollo Global Management, that's a U.S. private equity firm, paid Rackspace shareholders $32 per share. That's a 38% premium over the August 3 closing price of 2316 for 125.81 million outstanding shares. Rackspace space made a name for themselves in the private virtualized data center space with their stock price peaking at nearly $79 a share in late 2012. However, the company has struggled as of late with increasing pressure from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google in the public hybrid cloud space. Rackspace co-founder and chairman Graham Weston was excited to deliver cash to shareholders while also getting breathing room to make the investments necessary to transition Rackspace from a private dedicated data center provider to a public-private hybrid multi-cloud pay-as-you-go provider. The deal still needs the approval of stockholders and the FTC with an expected closing date in quarter four of 2016. iOS update 9.3.5 is an update you're going to want to install on all of your devices. This update patches three very large vulnerabilities. A single web link could take you to a place where software code could be executed through Safari's WebKit, gain access to the kernel, and execute code inside the kernel. Essentially, this one link is a one-step jailbreak while also inserting malicious code onto the device, granting access to all the phone's data and communications, including contacts, texts, emails, calls, pictures, and more. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Well, Citizen Labs and security firm LookUp look 
think it is, dubbing these three vulnerabilities the moniker Trident. Trident is used in a spyware product called Pegasus, which according to the investigation by Citizen Lab is developed by an organization called NSO Group. NSO Group is an Israel-based organization that was acquired by U- by the U.S. company Francisco Partners Management in 2010. Pegasus is a highly advanced in its use of zero days obfuscation, encryption, and kernel-level exploitations. If you haven't done it already, go and update your device. Well, happy anniversary, Windows 10. Oops, I broke your webcam. The issue is a redesign on how Windows 10 provides connections to video sources, where at the moment, only a single application at a time can use a video source. However, the solution in Windows 10 anniversary update was to bring in a new service called a frame server. This supports multiple connections from applications and shares the video data from the camera to every connected app. The oops is that perhaps the insider testing program was a little too homogenous and the testing program didn't reveal that the frame server breaks an awful lot of apps. Stay tuned. Microsoft says a fix is under development, but failed to convey a time frame for the fix. Now, yesterday, some folks panicked when their social feeds received words of Dropbox asking users to reset their passwords. While that story is true, don't panic. The breach wasn't really a breach, and the not breach happened in 2012. So Dropbox was only asking password changes from users who haven't changed their passwords since that event. The reset request was precipitated by Dropbox security personnel learning about an old set of credentials that were obtained in 2012, most likely from that mid-event. In that event, Dropbox surmises that several users fell victim not to a breach, but to common password reuse. Additionally, the same event had an email list being stolen from a compromised account, which led to the spamming of many Dropbox users. Far from being a panic, this is actually an excellent move by the storage company, being proactive in their security measures, while also giving them the opportunity to remind some users that they really ought to turn on two-factor authentication and probably change their password sooner than every four years. Facebook is always finding new ways to make their ads display to you in the spookier and a creepier way. If you've opted out of putting your phone number on Facebook, they might have found another way to get it in there anyways. If you use WhatsApp, and 1 billion users do already, you will soon share its phone numbers and the details of the last time you logged in to WhatsApp with Facebook. Either you stop using WhatsApp entirely or you attempt to use the partial opt-out WhatsApp is offering for a short period of time. Don't click agree right away on the new terms of services and actually try to read it, clicking down all the way at the bottom to the read more button. Scroll to the bottom and untoggle the share data sharing option. Leading privacy advocates have a bit to say about the change. They're filing a federal complaint accusing Facebook saying that they're violating U.S. law. As Claire Garland states from the Consumer Protection Council, Facebook's entire business model is premised on monetizing your user data. The key thing is that Facebook must give the users the choice to opt in when they're going to make privacy changes like this. Opt out is not good enough. It will be interesting to see the user trends that change the role as the change rolls out. Well, it seems the NSA has been exploiting a vulnerability in Cisco PIX firewalls. Sorry, but if you're still running a Cisco PIX firewall, you really got to get with it. This vulnerability has allowed the NSA to harvest your VPN encryption keys remotely, and they've been doing it for decades. But really, the PIX is ancient technology, and it's just as safe as the original WRT54G from Linksys, basically Swiss cheese. Time to put your PIX into a museum, folks. File this one under Chebert gets to talk about weird stories all the time and I want to as well folder. Back in 2003, Australia state started the virtual infant parenting program in which 57 schools were given robot babies that needed to be cared for as a real child. The theory was that they could deter teenage pregnancy if girls were forced to change, feed and care for baby terminators. It was a novel approach that was used by 1,267 girls aged between 13 and 15, while an additional 1,567 girls of the same age were monitored as they completed the regular health curriculum. Over the course of the three-year study, researchers found that the results of the program pointed to an increase in teen pregnancies, with 8% of the girls in the study becoming pregnant by 20 versus the 4% from the traditional curriculum. While it's easy to say, oh, those crazy Australians, it should be noted that the idea originated in the United States. The program is used in 89 countries. The dolls cost $1,000 each, and the margin of error basically makes the study a wash. Also, yeah, robots don't keep teens from having sex.
Intel has owned the data centers of the world for quite some time now, where 90% of all systems run on Intel and the platforms they provide. Historically, only one other company has such control over data centers, and Big Blue wants some of it back. IBM unveiled its Power9 chip at the Hot Chips conference this past week. Power9 chip is a biggie. It weighs in at 8 billion transistors. It's made of using the, 19, the 14 nanometer FinFET manufacturing process. IBM will be delivering the four variants of the Power9 chip that are characterized by scalability. The Power9 SO, or short for scale out variant, for machines aimed at servers with one or two sockets, and its single die chip will be 24 cores. Power9 SU, short for scale up, that will uh, for machines with four or more sockets, also targets IBM's AIX and IBM I operating systems, maxing out at 12 cores. Power9 SO chip has 120 gigabytes per second of sustained memory bandwidth. IBM is making the Power9 SO and Power S, uh, SU chips available with two different levels of simultaneous multi-threading, SMTP4, SM. I'm sorry, SMT4 with up to four virtual threads per core and SMT8 with at eight virtual threads per core. Look out for these beasts starting in the second half of 2017. Oh, adding insult to injury. The NSA seems to have a zero day attack for the Cisco ASA firewall too. The Cisco ASA security device took the place of the PICS as technologies grew, but it seems the NSA still have a way into the ASA with a zero-day attack that yields nearly complete control over the security device. The Ars Technica article goes on to say, it's still a critical vulnerability even though it requires access to the internal or management network, as once exploited it gives the attacker the opportunity to monitor all network traffic says mustafa al bassam a security researcher that told that broke the story to ours i wouldn't imagine it would be difficult for the nsa to get access to a device in a large company's internal network especially if it was in a data center wah, wah, wah. Wow, well, breaches and exploits, that does it for the blips. We've got some happier news coming up in the deep dive and in our interview. Uh, if you need to know about platform as a service, software as a service, again, you're not going to want to miss that. But first, let's take a moment to thank the sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's IT Pro TV. Now, I get asked all the time, how do I get into IT? Now, the way that I did it, and actually the way that a lot of people in my generation did it was... We just did it. It was brand new. It was something that was just coming around. But these days, it's more difficult. There's a lot more choices than just diving in and playing with the hardware. Some people like to do an apprenticeship. Some people like to go to class. Some people like to get certifications. What if I told you that there was a vendor out there, a vendor that was modeled after Twit TV, a vendor that understands that all of those choices are valid and they want to support you no matter what you choose? Well, folks, that's not a fantasy. That's IT Pro TV. IT changes daily, and a good IT Pro is always learning and trying to stay up to date with current technology certifications. Now, IT Pro TV's high quality video tutorials will not only keep your IT skills current, but they bring you closer to achieving that new IT job that you've been working towards. They offer over 1,000 hours of content, and they're adding new libraries every week. You can stream their courses live on demand worldwide to your Chromecast, to your Roku, your Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, or PC. Plus, you can learn on the go with your mobile device. IT Pro TV is the first IT provider with courses for sale through Amazon Video Direct, which gives you even more choices if you want to try their content before you subscribe. Now, their August courses include topics like CSAN, CCNA, routing and switching, CISM, and CEH version 9. IT Pro TV even includes more than 100 step by step virtual machine labs and transcender practice exams. That's a $109 value that they give you for free with your subscription. They'll give you a low monthly subscription rate with a no hassle cancellation policy. And I really mean no hassle. They're, they're not going to run you through a lot of hoops where they're hoping that maybe you'll just give up and keep subscribing. They make it easy for you to cancel your subscription because they are so confident that their content is compelling. Now, transcripts let you go from start to finish or just jump right to the part that you need that uh, you're referencing because you have a particular problem you have to solve. Uh, if you're currently signed up for an enterprise account with an IT Pro TV competitor and are subject to a rate increase because, you know, they love doing that, IT Pro has a deal for you. They will match your previous year's pricing on that account so that you and your team can learn at an affordable rate. With their client list filled with names like Harvard, MIT, UCSD, and Stanford, and with corporate and group pricing available now, you really don't have a reason not to at least try ITPro.TV. 
So here's what we want you to do. We want you to get learning. We want you to get your IT career kickstarted. Or we want to give you a reference so that you old veterans will have a way to go back and maybe recall that knowledge that's been lost in your memory banks. Check out itpro.tv slash enterprise to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications. Premium subscriptions are normally $57 a month or $570 per year, but we've got a special offer. Try it for free for seven days when you sign up using our code ENTERPRISE30 to check out their courses, their live stream, and more. You'll also receive 30% off the lifetime of your account. That's less than $40 per month or $399 for the entire year. Again, that's itpro.tv slash enterprise. itpro.tv slash enterprise. And use the code ENTERPRISE30 to try it free for seven days and save 30% off the lifetime of your account. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's go ahead and jump straight into the bytes. Well, we've got a little something something for those folks who like mobile apps, which means all of us. And for those people who use Google, which means all of us. You see, Google is upset with sites that spoil the mobile experience with pop-ups. And I know there's going to be a lot of people out there who resonate with this. Essentially, Google wants search results to favor sites that have the best information and the least annoying advertising that covers up that information. While the underlying content is present on the page and available to be indexed by Google, the blog post from Google on this topic says content may be visually obscured by an interstitial. This can frustrate users because they're unable to easily access the content that they were expecting when they tapped on the search result. Chibert, I want to throw this over to you. We've all had this experience where, yeah, pop-ups are annoying on the desktop or on a tablet when you've got a big screen. But on a teeny tiny screen where, where the ad can literally take up the entire space and, and because of poor design, the little close button might actually be off the screen and impossible to close without shutting down the window. Google is basically saying, look, you need to get smarter about your advertising, otherwise we have a net loss. Do you see this actually being a problem or is this just an annoyance? Oh, let's put it this way. If someone pops up an ad and I can't get to the controls or I can't, you know, get to the information I want, I stop. I just dump it and try something else. So to the advertisers that think this is really cool, no, you're actually losing um, business because people are getting really pissed off about this. And for God's sakes, test your stuff on a mobile device too. It's not hard. You know, Adobe's got some really cool tools. They need, you need to, you need to balance this. You don't go and slam an ad in someone's face and expect them to say, oh, great, I'm going to buy from you. No, it's going to turn them off and say, you're not worth my time. All right. Now, Lou, let me throw over to you a little bit because uh, of the three of us, you spend most of the most time in an actual enterprise environment. Uh, anytime there's a rollout of anything across an enterprise, it is thoroughly tested. And that means different platforms, that means different operating system, that means every t type of machine that you might have in an enterprise needs to experience uh, the patch, the rollout, the program before you certify it as enterprise ready. Does that start to need to happen to advertising? Because that seems, I mean, that doesn't seem like that's going to be something that they'll spend money on. Yeah, look, I mean, every every site seems to have a different kind of ad platform that they use. I think that, you know, um, you know, businesses that you pay for, like subscription-based services, they don't have any ads, they don't have anything to worry about. So they, they tend to not do pop-ups and other things to try to get away from that mobile experience. But I think sites that require ads, they have all their own different platforms. And I think this this type of thing is going to be tough even for Google to detect because, you know, based off of sites, most of their crawlers today will will pull down static web code, uh, HTML code, and they, you know, they'll, they'll analyze it that way. Now it sounds like they're actually physically rendering the page. And, you know, a lot of sites have tricky ways where they'll, they'll render the page and then you get to read the content for a second and then they start to show, you know, they execute JavaScript and the page updates and they start to actually see different things kind of float around and push your site down or up, That's, which is even more annoying to pop up for pop-ups than, than that. Uh, for me, so I think you know it all depends on how web uh, Google's even doing this. If you know they could put restrictions on it, but then people are just going to get smarter and and find out different ways to to display the ads. So I think I think to me it's more of just an annoyance thing, and they just need to have a standard of how they want things to be to be displayed. Right. Now, Google has 
well, I think the only approach that they can really do, which is they're going to crawl pages. And when they crawl pages, they're going to be looking for those pop-ups. So they're probably going to be looking, they'll actually scan what kind of ads pop up when they call up that page by the crawler. If your site isn't mobile optimized, or if it does really bad things with pop-ups, your ranking just goes down. Oh, Chibert, <laughs> I don't see websites taking this lying down. There, there's going to be a lawsuit at some point, right? Because they're going to say, you can't do this. You can't dictate what advertising providers we use. Uh, do you see that being a tenable legal position? I don't know. That Let's get the Twill guys in on this one. But, you know, I'm sorry. You know, there are other search engines, you know, tough. I, I don't like pop-ups. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't mind it if, you know, there's a sidebar and, you know, the sidebar that, you know, come up on different pages go, wow, that's really cool. And, you know, because they're playing nice, I'll go and click on it. But just like specs and some of the other folks mentioned in the chat rooms, like, yeah, vote with your dollars. Um, so yeah, maybe there's going to be a lawsuit, but my opinion, I don't think they got a leg to stand on really. I like that idea of voting with your dollars, but at the same time, it's, I think it's a tiny bit more complicated than that because uh, the pop-ups, they're not just pop-ups. Uh, Google is also going after the types of advertising that dynamically change the page. If you've ever been on a mobile device and you tried to click a link and suddenly the link moved as you made the click because another ad got served and it pushed the page down or up, that's <laughs> the little dirty secret. That's not a mistake. That's actually something that some designers will use to get you to accidentally click on an ad and get revenue that way. Uh, so in that sense, I, I'm sure there's going to be some of those who are running sites that are maybe not that big, maybe just need to fake a couple of clicks per day that uh, are going to say, fine, go ahead and rank us down. We're still going to get those mistaken clicks. We're still going to earn money. Is there a long-term solution? Is there, is there a way to convince, other than penalizing, these website creators and the content makers that it's in their best interest to make a responsive design that really only encourages people to click on an ad that they're actually interested in. Uh, Lou, what do you think? You know, I, I've been thinking about this for a while, actually. There is there is actually a way. I mean, I've gone to sites where I've had these, you know, especially the shifting. I hate that, you know, especially when you're on a mobile site and the site kind of jumps. And sometimes that's a development problem where you're you're dynamically injecting stuff and sometimes it's an, it's unintentional. But, you know, there there is a way to do it. And I think the way to do it is it's, it's user, it's crowdsourcing based. You know, a user goes to a site, they get ticked off based off an advertisement issue. They never want to go back to that site. So maybe they should tell Google about that, right? I think maybe that might be an option where they start to rank based off of two variants, one being the web crawling based uh, algorithms that they use and also being, you know, and clicks and so on, but also being based off of what users think. And maybe they can give you two different search results. One with, hey, the users think that this site sucks because of ads, and but we'll still give you these search results over here. Uh, that's that's that doesn't have that information in it. So I don't know. I mean, that that seems to be really the only option. I think without you know with, without trying to go and automatically detect these types of things. You know, I, I love our audience because they're so tech savvy. We've got Dr. Morbius, Emily, Emily the Strange, Java, who are all all chiming in. They're saying, yeah, you know, this is an annoying problem. I run no script. I make sure Java's disabled. I turn off Flash. All those things that we do in order to try to keep ourselves safe. But, you know, Tibert, there's a part of me saying, I shouldn't have to play this cat and mouse game, right? I mean, this, just work with me. What, what would you suggest? If you're at a university, if you've got this next generation <coughs> of, of content and web developers at your fingertips and you've got their ears, what would you try to tell them to convince them that they need to design better? Oh, I actually told some web developers recently that started adding in, you know, the hooks for pop-up ads. I said, do that again, you're fired. <laughs> I won't stand for it. I hate it. <laughs> uh, I really love Emily the Strange's idea about, gee, maybe we should have a Rotten Tomatoes um, ranking for websites. So this is the whole maybe, the shaming. Maybe that, yeah. yeah, shame them. You know, you're Catholic. Shame works, right? Uh... No. <laughs> we tried. Uh, but, okay, how much of this is just us being grumpy old men saying get, get off our lawn? Is there, is there a case? I mean, think outside of our regular mindset here. Is there a case to just, to just say, this is the web. I'm sorry. This is how it's going to be. It's not going to change. This is the new economy. Just get used to it. Anyone? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this is a point where you know the user base in most of these sites probably keep user trends and how much time they how many with the traffic trends that they get. If they notice that they're trending down, they need to they need to pinpoint what the reason of that is. And most likely, it's probably because they have some annoying garbage on their screen, and users just don't want to go back to it. I mean, news stories today you can find it on ten different sites, and I usually pick the ones that are not less annoying. So I think you know. Again, I think it's just the web and users are going to work around it however they can work around it. Like these guys are saying, no scripts and so on, or just go to the sites they know are not going to tick them off. So I think, you know, it's we either accept it and move, move ahead or we try to find tools around it. All right. I think that's the last word. That was that was sort of the fun story. I think that was a bit of a, a metanoia for all of us. We all hate that. We all hate those annoying ads. We all hate the pop-ups. We had, yes, the shame. The shame nun is going to be with us in just a moment to bring those websites to justice. But let's move on to something that's a bit more enterprisey. And what's more enterprisey than virtualization? Now, there is a company out there that uh, has, it's been a little bit on the rocks for the last couple of months, but um, I think they've finally figured out how to make profit off of uh, virtualization technology, and that's to give it away. Now, VMware has been giving away a version of uh, ESXi, that's the Microsoft Hyper-V gang uh, that, uh, that had that suit. Now, Microsoft started this hypervisor, hypervisor giveaway with its original Type 2 hypervisor back in the early 2000s. Oh, either way, it's looking like Microsoft is now trying hard to get more people into, into taking the Microsoft bare metal hypervisor approach and uh, that they shouldn't just automatically go with VMware as a default choice, which, which tends to be what people do right now. Now, Microsoft is playing the, the TCO. That's the total cost of ownership game. We've seen that a lot where you, could, you can say, look, it may be easier to get that free product, but that free product is going to cost you more over time. We saw Microsoft do this with Linux. They, they really pushed the TCO. We saw Microsoft do this with, uh, with Apple a while back, back in the 90s and early 2000s, where they were saying, well, that might look like a prettier box, but does it actually work inside your enterprise? Uh, Cheaper, let's just start with that. The TCA, TCO game isn't just a Microsoft thing, but... Sometimes it feels as if the TCO is a desperate ploy to say, no, really, we're still in this game. Is it that or does Microsoft actually have a point and over the long run, you're better using their virtualizer than VMware's? Well, I tell you, part of the cost of ownership is the training component. You know, I'm actually quite fond of Hyper-V and mostly because I can spin up a uh, sysadmin, you know, a student sysadmin or grad student or on a newbie, someone that just graduated. I can spin them up on Hyper-V a heck of a lot faster than I can spin them up on VMware. Um, I've actually been a fan. The product manager for the original Type 2 hypervisor from Microsoft, he and I were good friends. And, you know, I said, OK, uh, I'll, I'll humor you. I'll try your hypervisor. And it's like, ooh, this, this actually is really cool, being able to go and prototype a cluster of servers. Well, the Hyper-V world really and truly, only my opinion, only suffers because the licensing for it is so freaking confusing. <clears throat> and right now, you know, the cost, you know, how you, how you provision your virtual machines and so forth, it's not just what how much it costs to buy, but how much to own. And yes, sometimes the TCO argument, especially when you start throwing up big, big honking pages with TCO calculators on them, <clears throat> it does sound desperate, desperate, but I think it's the um, virtualization group saying, hey, we're not getting the message out. Let's try something else. Let's try some apples. Well, let's try, you know, let's try try the carrots instead of the sticks. And you know, folks, you have a copy of Hyper-V if you've been running Windows 8.1 or higher. Um, you just download it, go, and it uses the license on your machine. And you can run a Linux box. You can I actually run a Linux box, a BSD box, a um, XP, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, and Windows 10 because I want to do a lot of testing. Hyper, hypervisors in general are better than sl sliced bread. And the message about, yeah, training does cost a lot of money. Go Just try hypervisor. It's not, it's not as slow as everybody thinks. It's not as hard to use as everybody thinks. And there's a lot of really great tools. And so I totally agree with 
Microsoft on this. And yes, the Kool-Aid does taste very good, Lou. Okay, wait. I, I'm going to get to Kool-Aid, Lou, in just a bit. Lou, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, please tell me if... Actually, feel free not to answer if you feel like it's going to get you into trouble. But to T-Bird's point, yes, you can get Microsoft's hypervisor automatically if you've got 8.1 and above. Yes, you can try it. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. The first time that you get something running in a hypervisor, it's interesting. The tenth time, it's just the way you, you work now. You just, it's just much more secure. It's easier to be able to shut things down and not worry about getting infected or worrying about something messing up another process. However, Lou, there's something about Microsoft playing the TCO game that makes me chuckle because they undoubtedly have one of the most complicated pricing, pricing and licensing, licensing tiering strategies on the planet. I mean, at one point I could just say, well, I can't really calculate TCO because Microsoft, you've made the game so difficult. Is that changing? Do you feel that changing over there? You know, I, I don't know because I have no information into that at all, but I, I don't know if it's changing or not. But I do know that things seem to be getting better because I think you know, got to remember we're we're we have this kind of mandate internally to basically move a lot of things to Azure because it's really something that makes sense from a business perspective. And so we tend to start moving things over and we need to be able to figure out what it's going to cost us. Is it going to be more or less than what we're already paying? If we already have our own infrastructure moving over to Azure, is it going to be more or less? And so there's things that, you know, there are tools that they're providing that are making it a lot easier for us. So I'm, I'm, my thinking is it, it, it's got, just got to get better, right? Because people, companies are going to come and say, I'm on this and it's, what is it going to cost me to move to this? And a lot of times the cost of moving and, and changing and moving over is sometimes too great. And they decide to stay on something that maybe they even hate because of, the, because of that change costs. And so they need to be able to know what those costs are going to be in order for them to make the jump. And then what is it going to be later? How operating costs, you know, what is it going to cost me to actually use this? Is it going to be less than what I have? So tools have to get better. I mean, it's just a, something that has to be done. So I mean, whether it is happening or not, it just has to be done. Chibert, okay, let's put licensing aside for just a bit. Let's talk about tech because we've got Specs in the chat room who, uh, you know, he's asking a question I think is on the line, the minds of many of our audience members. And that is, it's not just price, right? I mean, you can get a free product from Microsoft. You can get a free product from VMware. There's, there's many different places that you can start playing with virtualization and different types of hypervisors. But both of us ha actually using both VMware and Microsoft products which one would you choose on the technical merits, on speed, on ease of deployment, and manageability of multiple clusters of servers? If you had your druthers and price was no object, which one would you take, Tibert? I default. My knee-jerk reaction is Hyper-V. Um, it's easier to install. If the machine can run Windows, it can run Hyper-V. Uh, VMware, I have to go... If I want... It's like, for instance, my number one is on Hyper-V, I just install it. I can use the local storage for um, ISOs. I can use it for virtual machines. I can use it for archives. I can use it for mirrors, you name it. It's just natural. On VMware, in order to use the local storage, I have to get the version of ESXi from the manufacturer of <laughs> the machine, the server. And if I'm using a white box server, good freaking luck. Um, ESXi does not like using local storage under normal circumstances, or it will only use it for ESXi. So if, say, for instance, you put a, you know, a terabyte drive into your machine that's running ESXi. Under normal circumstances, unless you have the correct drivers, that's only running ESXi. You can't store your images there. Um, and then, you know, management. Management from on a Hyper-V, I can manage it from a Windows 8 machine or higher very, very easily. The, the tools are just snap-ins, and I can manage them over the network. I can manage them over a VPN very nicely because all I'm sending are commands. Uh, VMware, I have to go in and use vCenter. I, you know, Hyper-V, I don't, I don't need System Center unless I really want to not lose my mind managing a lot of servers. But there's just more pieces, yeah. lots more pieces yeah. if you're playing the Citrix game. And there's a training curve. You know, the, the curve on um, VMware is, a, in my opinion, higher than Hyper-V. Hyper-V, I can get use, useful information, useful ser virtual servers very, very quickly, whereas 
VMware, I've got a little more effort to get up and running. See, I, I, I understand that. And I agree with you on most of those points. For me, though, the default is still VMware, but it, it's not the technical merits. It's inertia. I've just, I've ha all my images are in VMware. Everything I have, my entire library is VMware. And so I, I didn't want to split it. I didn't want to say, okay, these are going to run in VMware because I've already in, in, invested in the infrastructure and now I'm going to be running Microsoft on this side. Uh, but there, there is something, and Lou brought this up because they've got to push within Microsoft to push everything to Azure. Lou, is part of the strategy Microsoft trying to entice people like me who are stuck with inertia in saying, look, you can start developing your images on 8.1 and then move them into Azure and they'll work just fine. I mean, is, is that the grand overall strategy? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think I was just going to say, I mean, you can, I know you're stuck, you feel like you're stuck on VMware, but you can take those, you know, those VHD files and, and move them over fairly easy now. So, I mean, I think it's, that's obviously the strategy is to make it easy to move between the two virtualization technologies and make it easy as in maybe no cost up front, so to speak, other than maybe storage. If you want to put your VHDs in a blob storage somewhere, if you want to be able to, you know, replicate them multiple times. So I think that's the kind of thing is, I mean, that's, that's the big strategy. I think VMware has the problem where they don't necessarily have that strategy. So I think, yeah, I think that might be the easiest bootstrapping. You're, you're getting you on the new technology and making it easy, simple and cheap to do it is definitely a good strategy to have. You know, Lou, we may have to do that as a know-how. We'll bring you in for an enterprise know-how to, to show me how to convert my images because actually that would be a lot of fun. Cheaper, one last question from uh, Dutzfried in the chat room. Uh, he, he can't agree with your statement because while he does agree with the technical merits of Hyper-V, especially making server uh, 2008 and up easier to, to, uh, to manage, he doesn't see it being used in much production deployments. Uh, would you agree with that? I mean, it, it is, it would seem to be a, a superior technical solution, but maybe not a great management solution? Okay, from a management standpoint, no, I don't agree. Um, my personal opinion is System Center is a much richer management platform than vSphere. Now, having said that, though, I do agree, you know, Hyper-V is the dark horse, uh, VMware is definitely been the incumbent and has been for a very, very long time. Um, but I think my, you know, this is me guessing, by the way, I think our friends at Redmond Washington in the management suite are basically saying, hey, I think the uh, hybrid solution is going to be the answer. And truth be told, moving, having a hybrid cloud in a Azure and Azure for Windows. So Azure for Windows is the service that sticks on top of Hyper-V to make it into a local cloud are pretty nice. Um, my personal opinion is Microsoft needs to do some more marketing around that because I think they've got a really great product that I don't hear much about. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for that uh, little bit of a deep dive into some of the technologies that make our jobs easier. But coming up next, we want to make our audience's lives more fruitful with some workspace aggregation. We welcome to the show the CEO of Awingu. It is a, uh, a Dutch company coming from Holland with CEO Walter Van Uten. Walter, thank you very much for coming on to This Week in Enterprise Tech. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us. So uh, it's an honor. We are based in uh, Ghent, Belgium, not in Holland. Oh, sorry about that. And we have no problem, no problem. And we have affiliates in San Francisco and New York. So Owingu, we develops workspace aggregated software that uses the power of the HTML5 web technology. And that's to simplify remote access and bring your own device. Owingo is an online workspace where all your company files and applications can be securely accessed using any device without complicated plugins. So, and what makes us really unique is first of all, it translates legacy into HTML5. We have a unique and intuitive user experience. It is very simple uh, to install and to manage. And I guess you will not believe me, but it's true. An average deployment is less than three hours. 
and we can leverage past investments in software development, infrastructure, etc. And of course, with the result, a very strong TCO and an increase in productivity. Well, we were uh, sorry. Let me, yes. let me let me break in here. If if I were to try to sell this to my uh, my CIO or my CTO, yes. uh, and tell him we need a workspace aggregator, and he says, okay, well. What is a workspace aggregator? How would you differentiate this this new software as a service, this platform as a service? What what would be your elevator pitch to someone who's writing the checks to justify why they need a new type of service to offer secure access to resources and data? Yes. So what is important uh Today, users want to have access to all their applications, and all applications for a company today is the old legacy stuff, but also the new SaaS applications. And a user today is working with two, three, four devices, very often different form factor, different operating system. An example, live example is you have a Windows PC, you have an uh, iPad, and you have an uh, Android uh, smartphone, and you want to have access, secure access to any device, and you want to, to start an application on one device and continue uh, on, on your uh, tablet uh, in the meeting room later on without hassle and without the need to install software on it. And that is what we do, making ex making applications and files accessible on any device uh, without a hassle of implementations, etc. Got it. And okay. we can do it very fast without uh, and 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 by by uh, reusing uh, past investments. Got it. So the the the, the elevator pitch is, we can use everything you've got right now. But we give, yes. you, we give your employees a way to access the data that will not compromise the security policies that you've already put into place. Yes, and the only that thing you need is a connected, and the only thing you need is a connected device with an HTML5 browser. Got it. All right. So our audience, they're, they're tech savvy, so they, they know exactly what you're talking about. They've played with these types of solutions. Most of them have come up with their own solutions with varying degrees of success. And what they're most interested in is the demo. So can you show me how this actually works? With pleasure. It will be a pleasure to, to uh, show that. Uh, in a full screen mode is running a uh, Chrome browser. I have uh, I went to the URL demo.wingo.com. I just launched here because we are using the demo platform uh, only uh, username and password, of course, in an enterprise environment, we have always uh, strong uh, authentication, uh, one-time password, uh, uh, electronic ID card, etc. Now, what you see is we arrived in the workspace. Uh, you see I'm logged in as Walter. I have a green flag here, which means I have a good connection. And he did upfront a browser check because I said the only thing I need is the browser. And uh, everything looks okay. There, uh, I will show it. Uh, so everything looks okay. Then I have my workspace. I have my files. And what you see here is uh, a list of files, but, but the good thing is, as I said, we, we combine every kind of file. So we have files running on a traditional file server, but combined with cloud storage, a OneDrive or a Google Drive, etc. And then the third tab is applications. And here you have a list of all applications that are available in my workspace. And you can see it is from an, uh, a SaaS application, an, a very old AS400, uh, an old Visual Basic application, etc. I propose that I will launch a few applications. What, when I told you that we have a very intuitive approach, you see I launch uh, a, few, a few applications and I can show it much easier. I have my AS400. What you see here is the polygon, and the polygon allows me to navigate very easily to uh, any kind of uh, of uh, of any kind of application. Now you see here I have also my active session here, and in my active sessions you see I have three applications launched. I have a browser in browser because a very often used case is that you are uh, running uh, an intranet running on an old, older uh, Internet Explorer version that you want to have access on your uh, iPad or your Android. I have an AS400, very old uh, AS400 application. I will show that. Oh, oh, is this uh, is this only cloud-based, or can I do a, a hybrid deployment of this? 
It's hybrid deployment. So the uh, Wingu software can run on any kind of hypervisor, uh, any kind of hypervisor. It can run on private cloud, public cloud, or in a hybrid approach. So Microsoft, AWS, Google, or something yes. like that. So we are, we are since last year, we are uh, available on the uh, Azure marketplace. Okay. And uh, we are very excited because we are, uh, uh, we announced today that we have our presence in the global IBM marketplace, right, cloud right. marketplace. But you can run it on on an, uh, VMware, on on uh, uh, OpenStack, whatever you want. So you can see here, I launched my AS400 uh, in my browser. I can easily navigate. This is my my uh, intuitive approach. Where I told you, I have my uh, polygon approach. I can easily go back to my home screen, where I can uh, go to my uh, files, for instance. Uh, go back to my active sessions, go to my uh, an Excel, launching an Excel, create an Excel. Uh, a few other things that I, I want to show is, for instance, printing and VDI is always a mess. What can I do here? I can print to a local printer, I can print to a network printer, but I can also print to an Awingo printer. Give a good example, I'm in a hotel, I have not my, my, my PC not with me, I'm using the the PC in the lobby of the hotel. There is an old inkjet printer connected to the PC. I uh, launch through, go to the website of, or to, to the URL for my uh, environment. I log in. I go to my uh, ERP solution, my, my uh, uh, SAP, whatever. I print and it will automatically print without any worries about printer drivers to that connected printer by just using the Wingo printer. One feature. Uh, what is also nice, I show you the, uh, I go back again to my AS400. What can I do also is sharing of application sessions. What can I do is I share the session, not the application itself, but the application session. An application session by uh, providing a unique web link. So I can mail you this unique link. I configure it in a one-person control mode in, or in another one, of course, with the protection. And just by accessing the web link, you, have, you, you can interfere and you can take over the application session. Other things that are very easy is on a touch device, you have the uh, easy here, the, you, you can see here my, my three dots, but once I'm running on a touch device, I can uh, easy navigate with copy paste and, and other features. Uh, so for uh, in, in files, the same, I have access to any kind of uh, file. I can select a file and then on actions, I can do the same. I can drag and drop from a browser if I'm allowed by the uh, IT administrator that I can upload or download. But I can also share an uh, application. Uh, I can also share an, an, a file uh, sharing with an expiry date, with an expiry time in a preview mode or in a download mode. I grant, give the access internally within the company or in an uh, uh, outside the company. Um, so this is and pretty what is comprehensive. I mean, this is a comprehensive sharing of resources and data, which yes. I it, I need to I need to ask about security because our audience is going to yes, say with course. this comprehensive list of everything that a user has access to. First, tell me yes. what you've done to make sure that uh, this is not going to be a point of breach for me. And secondly, does this integrate with AD? So can I control user access with policy from a central management console? Yes. Uh, how so how do I roll that out? Okay, so that is very important. So first of all, what, what we have is we, we connect to the AD, to the, the uh, LDAP AD server. So we are, uh, we, we, uh, a Wingu is, is like an, 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 is, is a virtual appliance that make connections, connectors to the backend. Got it. So, so that is very important. So IT admin stay for 100% in control of, of uh, the backend. Uh, but but on top of that, I showed you legacy stuff, old stuff, etc. But what you also can do is you can uh, we have a single sign-on with all SaaS. We have an integration with Azure AD, integration with Okta. So you can really combine the old stuff 
with new SaaS applications. And for, from an IT admin perspective, this is really important. IT admin have full control by just granting a user uh, credentials, by, by giving the, the user credentials. He have a full control over everything what the, what the user is doing and full insights. So what is very different versus traditional VDI is that, that uh, with, with a Wingo, the IT admin, uh, really knows exactly what is the user, user is doing, where is he located, uh, fully application insights, etc. So as, as long as the administrator has done his job of setting policy right in AD, yes. it just gets inherited. Uh, so yes, uh, how about this? Uh, I, I understand it's a virtual appliance, but is it full yes. gateway or is there any data that gets stored inside the virtual appliance? No. So we, we don't store data. So the, uh, it is uh, fully secure. We have no call home function functionality to the device. So IT admin is in full control. And, and what we see often, it, it can, the, a Wingo appliance can, as said, can run in public cloud or can, can run on, on site in the, in the private environment of the customer or in a hybrid approach. Got it. And, in a redundant uh, hybrid uh, approach. What about auditing? Because at some point there will be a breach. I mean, that's just how enterprise networking is going to work. Do I have a secure way to log everything that's gone through the gateway yes. so I can make sure that that wasn't my point? Really, everything is, is locked, uh, what the user is doing. I'm, uh, at the moment, I am, uh, as an administrator, oh, and I think I have here, uh, I switch back to So I'm in the management console. I'm an, uh, logged in as uh, administrator, and I have my full insights. I have uh, all my audit tra trails. I can see all my activity. I can see uh, in application sessions who did what, uh, who is working, but also the full, full, full list. It, it will take, of course, a time, because a, a bit time. Right. But you can see every action that the user did is fully uh, can fully be viewed by uh, by the IT administrator. Yeah, we well we want one hundred percent transparent time. failure. So this is this is a good good step. Oh, in terms of uh, of the auditing, uh, yes. where is that data stored? That actually is in the appliance, or do I store that offsite? You can store that offsite. Okay. Yes, that's of course very important. We have a, we have very nice customer references, and for instance, in Belgium, I, I think one of our really nicest uh, customers is the federal police in Belgium, and we have also the chancellery of the prime minister in uh, Belgium, and of course, security, data privacy, etc., is key, of course, for them. I'm, I'm going to want to bring in my uh, co-host in just a bit to, to talk this over a little bit as a panel, but let's okay. let's get some of the finer points for those who might actually be interested in in a solution like this, and the finer points would always be pricing. So what what yes. is your pricing structure? How do you license out? Uh, is it a is it a per deployment? Is it per instance? Uh, and what okay. would I be looking at for a deployment of say, a hundred, two hundred mobile employees at any given time? Okay. So first of all, I think it's important to, to mention that we are working 100% indirect. So indirect, in the tr classic licensing software, we have uh, Ingram Micro and Tech Data and other distributors as global distributor for us. Uh, we sell licenses. We have licenses in subscription and in perpetual uh, base. And what you have to, to remember is an end user pricing of uh, $7 per month per concurrent user. Okay, that's and it's bad. starting as of uh, with the virtual appliance starting with 20 users. Okay. So it is really cheap. <laughs> really, really cheap. And because it's a virtual appliance, again, uh, the IT administrator gets to, to determine where it gets and, deployed. If it's on-premise, on cloud, etc. Yes. And to give you an answer on the capacity, for 100 users, you need a virtual server with a capacity 8 gigabyte, uh, 8 core. Right. Oh, we've got uh, a dude's fried in the class in the in the classroom in the chat room asking if this is a cloud service or a device. Uh, this is this is a virtual appliance, and so yes. anywhere that you can put a virtual appliance, this solution yes. will run. That's that's how yes. that works. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Fantastic, Walter. Thank you very much. Let me go ahead and bring in my co-host because uh, they, I can see them in my little avatar. They're brimming with questions. Chebert. Okay. Uh, now we've seen 
a few things like this on This Week in Enterprise yes. Tech over the last couple of years. This one seems to be a little bit different. I mean, this is not pure VDI. This is this is something else. Where, where would you put this in the categories of, uh, of infrastructure that we've seen over the years? This is, a, this is very clearly an HTML5-based um, web remote access system with capability of multiple gateways. Uh, I, my big question for Walter is, if, say, for instance, I'm running, um, I'm running this on-prem, so virtual presence on-prem, and I have three regional offices around the world, um, if I buy enough seats for my corporation, do I have to also spend more money for each virtual appliance, or is that strictly licensed by concurrent, um, by either concurrent users or by seats? I, I, I missed that. It is by concurrent user. Very so nice. you can uh, you can deploy an, uh, an, a redundant setup with two virtual appliances, but it still counts the number of concurrent oh, users. I like that. That's nice. Very so, nice. I, so we really what, what the, the red uh, what is really important for Avingo it is in our uh, marketing in our pricing is simplicity. Simplicity is really key with Avingo. Once Avingo is a company, the product is solution. We only have one solution. We have uh, one version of it. So we have not. It is uh, pricing scheme is very easy. Yeah? If you compare it with a Citrix or, or with a VMware. It, you need to follow a, a, a sales training just to be able to, to make an offer for your customer. With a Wingo, it's an easy calculation. Hey, uh, Lou, could you uh, tell the folks at Microsoft that this is actually a really good licensing structure? You know, the, the whole idea of, <laughs> does it matter how big the enterprise is? It's the total number of concurrent users. I, I'll, I'll, have to pa I'll have to pass that could along. You, could you sure. talk to Satya? I know you have coffee <laughs> with him every other week. Maybe, maybe just pass that along. Pass it along for sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, Walter. Uh, the other thing, and th this is something that's coming from our chat room, they want to know about the mobile workforce. I mean, this is ostensibly something for companies that have a lot of people who move around a lot. You don't want to invest a lot of infrastructure that, that you may not be using at any given time. But where does the design, where does the, the, the features for the mobile user come in? Is it just because it's HTML5? Does it work well yes. on pretty much any device? How would you pitch it to someone who's going to have 30 salesmen that he will never see. Okay, so what is very important, as, as really said, the only requirement is have internet connectivity and have an HTML5 browser. So the device, it is doesn't matter, it is a tablet or an, uh, an uh, iOS or an uh, Windows or an Android, it's HTML5. And then what we are doing, we are leveraging a lot on HTML5. HTML5 is extremely powerful. And we are optimizing on bandwidth. So with very limited bandwidth, uh, we, we can uh, bring very good user experience uh, for, for, the, the, for the end user. Uh, what is also so nice things is that, that we really translate all legacy to HTML5. To give an idea, if you're using a traditional RDP on a tablet and you switch from uh, landscape to, to portrait, you have to, to, to turn your head within a Wingu. It's like the browser, you change the browser and applications, resizes, etc. without touching the, 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 the application by ourselves. Okay, so it's it's truly, a, it's an HTML5 responsive design. So yes. it would just resize yes. automatically very, very, for whatever yes. screen. So what is important, we have a, a, a number of uh, uh, patents spending, of course, and, and of, of course, leveraging on, on that HTML5. Uh, we, we can work very good with, with uh, moving content. And because of what? Because HTML5 is, is used to do so. so I, guess, I guess one question we were throwing, throwing around in the chat room, too, is, um, you know, how, how is this different if, if a customer did want to kind of have a combination between you know, a, the Zen app and the Zen desktop kind of support. Yes. I know that sometimes those, those things are a little bit difficult to get deployed, but and then the pricing is obviously difficult. But, you know, from a technology standpoint, how similar are the two? So the good thing is, with, of course, we, we, we prefer scenarios where a, a customer switches from a Citrix or a VMware to a Wingu. But as we are a challenger, we are a newcomer, uh, it is an, not an uh, or, but an end. Uh, story. You can combine an environment uh, running on Citrix or VMware and you combine that with a Wingo because we connect to the application servers. We leverage fully on, on a terminal server RDP technology. 
Uh, so how we enter in, in big organizations today is very often there is a mobile workforce or they want to use uh, tablets in companies and they have, uh, it, it's not working that good or, or not working with the Citrix. Uh, and for a certain uh, number of users, they start with a Wingo uh, without having to change a lot on the back end. And what we see afterwards is, is that it, it's uh, the, the easiest way for us to, to enter very quickly in an organization and then they, uh, uh, they, they extend the number of users or switch totally to, to a, a Wingo. All right, I, I'm sold. Chibert, Lou, do you, do you want to throw in here anything before uh, before we, we let them go back to uh, bed? Because, my goodness, we're in a horrible, horrible time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd love to take this. Now, I'm having a quick conversation with Cursed One in the chat room. And he says he yes. hel recently helped him deploy a Citrix uh, VDI environment in his last job. One of the biggest costs was the software licensing. A number of apps do not support concurrent user Yeah. Preaching to the choir here. Now, I do want to point out that one of the one of the prices in the Citrix system that I set up recently is the cost of Netscaler. Netscaler yes. is an insanely expensive gateway system, and the reality is, is they license by the amount of bandwidth, and even their 100 meg per well 200 meg per second virtual appliance was $17,000 on academic pricing. So this this very much reminds me of the product from Aerocom Corporation. Uh, it looks a little prettier in different ways. Um, but I think this is where VDI and that type of technology actually has a chance of happening. Whereas the traditional heavy licensing of Citrix and so forth is actually killing the industry. So, Walter, thank you very much. This is a great, great system, and it's much more reasonable for academics like myself. I, I, we, have, we do have one last bit from the audience because they're, some of them are very enamored by your solution. If they wanted to try a demo, if they wanted to see if this is going to work for their enterprise, for their deployment, is there a demo program available? Is there a way for them to actually just try out the solution? Yes, go to www.wingo.com, get your free trial, and uh, within a few uh, minutes later, you can try the solution. Also important is if you want to, th then you have access to the, the generic demo, the public demo platform. If you want to test it yourself, you can go to or the Azure Marketplace or to the IBM Cl Cloud Marketplace. You can uh, deploy straight through a Wingo appliance and, the f and we have a freemium model for the first two users. So you can deploy everything, do everything for two, for two users. Walter, thank you very much. We've been speaking with Walter Van Uten. He is the CEO of Awingu, uh, which is not in Holland. It is actually a Belgium company, which is better because they've got much better beer and a much better soccer team. Uh, we thank you for joining us on This Week in Enterprise Tech. We love to bring in guests who can actually show off their solutions, and you have done that. This is your time. Anything you want to plug, if you want to drive them to Awingo once more, if you want to give them your Twitter address, what would you like our audience to walk away from this episode knowing about you and your company? First of all, I, I want to thank you all because it was a good opportunity, but go to the, the Awingo site. There you can see a lot of use cases of Awingo. And most importantly, start a free trial. If you need, uh, you have additional questions, feel free to contact me directly, walter at wingo.com, or uh, send me a, a message via Twitter or uh, via LinkedIn. So uh, looking forward uh, to, to uh, receive uh, questions or uh, whatever. And uh, thanks again. How about that, Twight, right? A CEO that will actually let you email him. That, that's a little bit different. Walter, again, thank you very much. And uh, you know what? Assuming that we can get another player, who we won't mention because we don't want to scare them away, but another player, would you be willing to come back on This Week in Enterprise Tech for a panel about PaaS and SaaS? Definitely. Thank you. Again, we've been sp speaking with Walter Van Uten. We thank you for joining us here on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Of course, folks, you have used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe that's according to nine out of ten platform as a service users we want to thank our co-hosts who i would not be able to do this show without starting 
with Mr. Brian Chi. He is he's really he's the muscle behind this week in enterprise tech. I'm I'm I think I'm the the face. I'm the pretty face. But but Chibert, Brian Chi, what do you want the Twite Right to know about what you're going to be doing over the next few weeks? I've been getting some absolutely spectacular feedback from the folks on the um, the Twitter feed. I'm ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. And I've been getting some great ideas um, for show topics, people to invite, and also some great talk topics. Um, this is things slow down here, I'm going to make an attempt to get the VPN episode of Chebert's Enterprise Cookbook done. Yay, we like cookbooks, especially when they deal with tech. Of course, he's not the only coast we had on this episode. We had Lou Maresca. Lou, if Chebert is the muscle, you're sort of the brain, I'd say. What do you uh, want people to know about what the brain will be doing this next week? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you can always follow me on Twitter, Lou MM, and uh, actually check out uh, soon. Check out uh, MicrosoftCRM.com. We're coming up some new stuff and uh, some new licensing and so on. So check it out there soon. Indeed. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, it's always a pleasure to do This Week in Enterprise Tech because, well, I just like hanging out with like minded geeks. But we want to do something for these people. That's right, the people who are watching, who are listening right now. We couldn't have a show without you. We want to make it easier for you to get your enterprise fix. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash quiet. There you'll find not just all of our back episodes, but you'll also find a link for you to subscribe, which means that you can get the version of your choice of every show automatically downloaded into your device of choice. If you want the audio version in your iPhone so that you can listen to us on the way to work, you could do that. If you want the, a video version in your Android tablet so you could watch us on your break, you could do that. If you want the high definition video version on your Mac, your PC, wherever it might be at home so you can watch us in high definition, you can do that. Again, just go to twit.tv slash quiet. Also, don't forget that you can find me on my Twitter account at twitter.com slash Padre SJ. If you follow me, you get to find out what I do when I'm not here recording This Week in Enterprise Tech or any of the other Twitch shows. It's just a fun way to ask questions and maybe suggest guests for future episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Don't forget that we do this show every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Go to live.twit.tv to watch our pre, our post, and our actual show. You get to see all the stuff that gets cut out of the final edit. And of course, as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. If you do that, I get to see you right down there. And you can actually participate in the show. You can throw questions for our guests, and you can ask about what's going on. It's all part of the magic that is Twit TV. Finally, thanks to everyone here in the studio who makes this show possible, of course, to Lisa and Leah for letting us to continue do This Week in Enterprise Tech. For Chebert, who, in addition to being a co-host, is also a fantastic producer. He's the guy who gets us the guests, folks. So if you uh, like where Twight is going, be sure to send him a ring. And finally, to our director, our technical director, a man who really knows needs no introduction because we know him here as the shark. That's right, Kevin. Kevin, do you have a camera on yourself? Do you, do you have a microphone that you can speak into? Or do Ooh, we have that set Pretty up blinky lights. There we go. Everything is like all over the place right now. So. now uh, Kevin, this is normally the time of the show when uh, we give you the opportunity to redeem yourself by asking you the question of the week. And uh, I guess the question of the week here, Kevin, would be what actually happened to the passengers in Lost? <sighs> um... Uh, <laughs> Shame. Oh, no, Shame. no, no, I'm sorry. That's wrong. They were exiled to Walmart. Thank you very much for playing. We'll try again next week. Don't be there. Folks, don't forget to check back again next week. Until then, I'm Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.